and welcome to Space 2090, the Space Exploration Podcast. This podcast is for everyone enrolled in Geography 2090, Space Exploration, in the Department of Geography at Western University. My name is Andy Bednar. I'm a part-time assistant professor in the Department of Geography at Western University in London, Ontario, Canada, as well as an analyst with the Canadian Space Agency in Ottawa, Ontario. This week, it's back a bit closer to the Earth. By about half an AU or so, we're right back at our old friend, the Moon. Now that we're into the part of the course where we're talking exploration, I wanted to dig a bit more into the origin of our neighbor, the Moon. Of course, back in week seven, we read about the formation of the solar system and the Moon a little bit. And this week's podcast adds to that story with some more detail on some of the more unique aspects of the Moon's formation as well as the variety of ideas that existed throughout the past hundred years or so to explain just where the moon came from. Uh, To help with this, I once again brought a guest to the podcast, this time Dr. Patrick Hill, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Alberta and another Western alum. Patrick has worked with Apollo samples in his PhD research where he actually blasted that moon dust with an electron beam to measure the spectral reaction. And fun fact, there are samples of the moon from the Apollo missions at Western. Uh, I won't tell you exactly where, but they are certainly under lock and key. So you'll hear a little bit more uh, about that as well as the overall history uh, of geological study of the moon. So as always, make sure to take good notes. And without further ado, I hope you enjoy my chat with Dr. Patrick Hill on the origins of the moon. Hey, 2090. Uh, we're here for the podcast this week to talk about the origin of the moon. So I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Patrick Hill. Uh, Patrick's currently working out of the University of Alberta in his postdoctoral research. He, of course, did his doctoral research at Western with myself and some of the other guests we've had this year. Uh, Dr. Stuke, uh, Dr. Aaron Francis, Dr. Tanya Harrison. Um, and this week, to follow up on the virtual lecture, we're talking about the origin of the moon. So where did the moon come from? And that is probably a super simple and obvious question you may or may not have ever really thought about. Um, of course, when we took, uh, when we looked at the origin of the solar system a few weeks back, you probably saw the answer in some ways. Uh, but what's interesting about the moon is that it does have this relatively unique origin story in some ways compared to a lot of bodies in our solar system. And what we're gonna do with Patrick today is go over some of the different ideas of where this thing came from and how we know whether or not those ideas uh, are more accurate than the others and uh, where we are today in regards to where the moon came from um, and what is the geochemistry of the moon. So thank you for being here, Patrick. Oh, my pleasure. How are you doing? Good, good. Good. (laughs) Are you excited to be here? Oh, totally. So excited. <laughs> Moon just gets me going. <laughs> um, so let's let's talk about the first kind of realistic geological idea of where the moon would have come from and when roughly that would have been kind of popular. Yeah, so I guess before the Apollo missions in the late 1960s, there were three main ideas just sort of hovering out there. Uh, The first one uh, came really from our understanding of planet formation. Uh, So you might have talked about it, but there's this notion of accretion that there was this dust cloud around the star and it's spinning rapidly. And from that, we condensed star solids and formed different planets. Um, There was an original idea that proposed that maybe the Earth had sort of like a micro dust cloud around it. And from that, you condensed out the moon around this co-accretionary disk. So the moon and the Earth formed from similar moons, two balls spinning around each other. Uh, around the same time, there was a little maybe the, we knew that other planets like Jupiter had moons and Saturn had moons. So maybe it formed around one of those gas giants or a bigger planet and was just launched into the inner solar system. And we caught it. Um, and then there was an idea proposed by Charles Darwin's son, George Darwin, about 
1800s really. And geologists back then uh, didn't know of plate tectonics. And so they were trying to explain different properties of the Earth's surface. And he looked at the Pacific Ocean and he saw how big it was. And he didn't, couldn't explain it in the modern mechanisms that we can. And so he saw it as just a giant scar. And so he proposed that the moon, the Earth was spinning so fast that the moon just sort of spun out of the Earth. Uh, almost like a burp or a vomit after you go on a merry-go-round and it just comes out and from that accretion you form a small ball. So before Apollo we had the, that co-accretion, Earth has a spinning disk sort of like Saturn and that comes together and forms the moon. Capture it forms around say Jupiter or a gas, gas giant or in the asteroid belt it gets captured and um, uh, the fission theory, which was the sort of burp came out of just thrown out of Earth. So the, that was before Apollo. So yeah, let's let's touch a little bit on each of those before we jump to the hypothesis that came out of the Apollo research. So co-accretion, this one kind of from the surface of it, from someone who doesn't necessarily get a sample of the moon to look at it, kind of makes sense, right? Everything else in the solar system seems to have this origin. Um, and we even know today that there are little moons forming in Saturn's rings. Um, so it would make sense if they all came, if all of that came together mm -hmm. to form um, a tiny little, or in Earth's case, a big moon. Um, so I guess if you can think kind of maybe off the top of your head, what are some of the evidence in favor of the co-accretion and maybe some, at least a piece of evidence that kind of suggests maybe that's not the case? Yeah, so... Um, I'll talk about evidence. The, the co-accretion model was the favorite model going into the Apollo missions. And it wasn't until after Apollo that that really got dismissed. But I mean, the strong evidence for it, which I think you've already said, was we saw this kind of process around Jupiter. We saw it around Saturn, uh, Titan, Europa, all of these bodies, sort of Earth's, uh, Mars size, uh, um, Moon size, sorry. So it seemed like this was the dominant moon forming process for a moon our size. Um, against it was sort of, there's a big size difference between Earth and Saturn and uh, Jupiter. And we don't see those size moons around Venus. Uh, and we certainly don't see that around Mars. Mars has two satellites, which are, are much smaller. Um, Phobos and Deimos, I put yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, which are more asteroid-soid bodies. Uh, and so just looking at it before having any material, you have this dominant process, but it seems to only be happening with big, big bodies. Yeah, and I mean, for Jupiter to have a moon at relative scale to what Earth has, that moon would be the size of why it would be massive. It would be beyond, it would be bigger than the Earth. Exactly. Yeah. So this is one of the very unique components of Earth's moon is its size and relationship to it is very strange. The only other relatively similar situation in the solar system is Pluto and Charon. Um, those, of course, being a dwarf planet and a moon, they are tidally locked as well and are roughly the same size. Um, but the Earth for an inner rocky planet it's very strange to have this very big moon. Uh, as, as Patrick pointed out, Mercury has nothing, Venus has nothing, and Mars just has two little asteroids um, that it probably captured or their chunks of Mars. So Yeah, and I would say, um, just to add on to that, for the capture theory, the re main reason that fails is because it's not an asteroid-side body. Uh, it wasn't necessarily the Apollo samples that disproved the capture theory. It was more just numeric modeling. The Earth isn't big enough to slow something the size of, it's, well, it's more of a physics problem than a geologic problem when it comes to the capture theory. Yeah, and that's what I was gonna say next. The capture theory is kind of, even again, not being a physicist myself or a geophysicist, just knowing the geography of the solar system I can't really figure out a basic process in my head where a, an object the size of Earth is capturing something the size of the moon. Right. Uh, 
So we haven't seen anything similar to that. Um, and that's one of the reasons the capture hypothesis isn't really favored anymore. Do you know anything about the origin of the capture hypothesis or why that really emerged? I mean, I can understand astronomers see that process often. Um, so they just applied it to the moon. Yeah, I think, oh, I can't remember his name, but there was someone who compared it to Phobos and Deimos as well as some of the, I mean, Jupiter and Saturn. I believe Saturn just overtook Jupiter for the number of satellites. Uh, but the 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 ones, the big, the non-big ones, there's hundreds of these asteroids, right? Um, yeah. These smaller satellites and even, I think, I mean, there's that second satellite of Earth, which would most yeah. likely be a example of a capture theory. And I mean, Phobos is in 12 kilometers in diameter. That's the distance from London, Ontario to uh, St. Thomas, right? So they're much smaller bodies that that the Earth is able or a Mars sized body is able to capture. Um, so it was still sort of popular ish around when we were going to Apollo, but I think physically it made less sense than the condensation theory, even though the condensation theory uh, had that notion that you would need a bigger, we had only seen examples with Jupiter or Saturn. Yeah. So let's talk about the weird one, because I was just teaching this to a kid the other day, uh, the four origins, and I was just remembering kind of one of your lectures to my class. And I called it the burp hypothesis, where Earth kind of just burps out the moon. And he asked, mm -hmm. you know, is this is a, I think a 12 year old kid. And he said, well, that kind of seems unlike the other ones. The other ones kind of seem scientific and probably because I called it the burp, but <laughs> it does seem a little bit strange. Um, and it, you know, it has this strange lineage too, because it's Charles Darwin's son. Um, but what, what, <laughs> where did this come from? And I mean, it doesn't seem hard to disprove, but I guess mm. it would be an uphill battle to prove. Yeah, it was it, well. It came from his observations of um, basically trying to explain the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Um, so I mean, you have to imagine you're a 19th century scientist, and you're tr you have this vast body of water, and you don't know how it formed. Um, but so all that you know about it is that it's this huge depression, I guess, mm -hmm. and that's why it's full of water compared to continental crust. And I mean, plate tectonics, our modern interpretation of how yeah. oceans and crusts form didn't arise what well, was first proposed in the 1910s and so this was before then. Um, and I guess his observation was as he was looking at the, the moon and, and just sort of Propose that maybe the reason why we have this giant depression that we now call the Pacific Ocean is because it's a huge chunk of rock just came out of it as the Earth was spinning so fast when it was formed. Um, I would also say at the time, geologically, there was two sort of modes of thinking. Um, there was catastrophic and uniform terrorism. So at the time, there's this debate um, of whether geologic events are instantaneous and constantly happen. And sort of the people that support that formation, uh, that sort of process uh, would be people that in the day would have been more religious and believe that the Earth was only 6,000 years old. So everything's mm. happening really, really quickly. Everything's catastrophic. Um, and they would point to, say, volcanoes as their example. Uh, Uniformitarianism came from people that were studying sediments, and they looked at layers, and they they started to think that the old was Earth was much older than it was. So I think Charles Darwin's son George was probably coming at it from a catastrophic uh, school of thought process, and was trying to explain how the Pacific Ocean could form and why it, why it could be there. And I think he used that thinking. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because uniformitarianism, uniformitarianism sounds like the more, it sounds like a weird religious cult. Yeah, but it's not. It's, <laughs> it's the less religious of the two. Okay, so, and this is also important to think, I mean, if, if some of my students are not earth science students, but 
plate tectonics, which is a fundamental component of understanding our, our planet and its history, uh, is quite new. It's in some ways less than 100 years old in terms of acceptance. Um, it was proposed by a guy named Wagner. Yep, uh, Wagner. Veg Alfred Wagner. Yeah, Alfred Wagner. So this was proposed, you know, in the 1910s, and it was a very, it took a long time to catch on, but the evidence is quite clear for it because rock formations on different sides of the ocean are identical, um, and there's really only one way that can happen. So you do putting your, you know, just like with Mars and just like with some of the stuff we talked about at the beginning of the course, it's hard to imagine, but only 50 to 100 years ago, not only our planet was poorly understood, but definitely the other planets. So. I know some of these ideas sometimes sound stupid, but it, we've come a long, long way, and especially in the last 50 years. Um, and that ties to the kind of the hypothesis that changed everything. And this is typical in geology, I'm sure. Once you get a physical sample to work with, uh, it's quite easy to start making advancements that would have taken forever remotely. Uh, so what, what happened with the Apollo samples and how did that kind of revolutionize lunar geology? So I guess going into the Apollo missions, if you think of our, our sort of models that we have, if we have the condensation theory, so it's just co-accreting as the Earth is also forming. So it's sort of sourcing the same material as the Earth. And so if that's the case, when the Apollo samples come back, we really expect it to be identical to the Earth, just a, a mini me, a small, pseudo earth going around the earth um, with regards to the capture theory we could get some you know different sort of compositions uh, it should still sort of be earth like because even before we went to the apollo it looked rocky it was clearly not icy mm -hmm. um, so it shouldn't be like a uh, a moon from jupiter or Saturn like Europa or Enceladus, but it should be rocky. Um, and then for the fission theory, it should look like the upper mantle. So his theory proposed that the rocky portion of the crust should have come out because the core would have been too heavy to come out with it. And so when they return samples from Apollo, um, it really caused a problem because chemically the moon was a little different well not a little different it was quite different chemically from the earth these are rocks that sort of um, are quite distinct from the earth because of the type amount of oxygen that's present and the evolution of the rocks and i mean for me it's one of the main reasons why um people are who believe that the moon moon landings are fake are really wrong is because the people in order for it to be true nasa would have to manufacture rocks that are completely extraterrestrial the greatest people on earth can't you can't uh, ignore earth's atmosphere and gravity right uh, and then there was another issue uh, and it sort of came a bit later on when we started sending more satellites and trying to put things in orbit but we realized seismically that um and from moments of inertia that the moon's crust was uh core was really small so it, that really disproved the condensation theory because you had no means by which the moon should have a different composition and a core of a different size because it should be identical and just a mini me version of the earth so let me let me see if I think I get that as a non-geologist, because if it's the exact same material as the Earth, it should segregate the same way that the Earth's material does. Exactly. But it yeah. has segregate. Yes. So like oil and water, if you have two cups of oil and water, they're going to split the exact same way. But if they, they split have, dif yeah, if they split different, different amounts. Amounts. Yes. Yes. I know, Patrick. God. <laughs> <laughs> But what I'm trying to tell the students is if they're the same material, they should have similar periods of separation, the way that the heavy stuff sinks to the bottom um, and, and the light stuff kind of stays on top, this differentiation process. And if that is radically different with the moon, 
then it's a good indicator that it is not of the same origins as the Earth. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, the the Earth has not a huge core. Um, it's about 30% of the weight of our planet because it's so dense, it's iron, nickel. And the moon, on the other hand, has 5%. So how do you explain such a heterogeneity between two things that are formed from the same material? Right. Yeah. So I think you were going somewhere when I cut you off. I don't know if you remember now, though. Um, and I guess for the capture theory, it broke down for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, I think, as we already said, numerical modeling showed that we simply didn't have the uh, capability to slow a body that size. Um, but also chemically, if it was formed elsewhere in the inner solar system, um, it should still have those relatively same proportions. Um, but it doesn't for that reason. The moon is very iron poor for whatever reason. Mm. And so they were sort of left with this notion that where do we go from here? And sadly, they're stuck with the fission theory. And by the late 60s, plate tectonics, it was in the 60s that plate tectonics started to become generally accepted. Uh, and so we couldn't explain that that's where the Pacific came. And there's a whole mass problem there too. But the notion that the moon came from the upper crust and mantle material, and only that, does explain why it would be so iron right. poor. Yeah. And so it was in the 70s that this notion that what if an impact happened that ripped the more silica rich at SiO2 and, I, and left the iron rich material of the Earth behind. And so that's where this notion of the giant impact hypothesis came from. So it's funny, George Darwin's theory is ludicrous because we know that's not how the Pacific formed. Right. And uh, it, the Earth certainly was not spinning fast enough. Calculations, you can't get a 24 hour day at the rate required for a spinning top to just launch out that amount of material. And so, ironically, he was completely wrong, but sort of right in that most of the moon's material came from the mantle and crust. Yeah, I, I didn't actually realize that, but in a sense, like the giant impact hypothesis, which is the one we're gonna land on and then talk about a little bit more, it's kind of a salvaging of his pretty bad idea. It just adds in the one mechanism he was missing, which is how do you get a bunch of earth crust and mantle material off of the earth? Yep. And the answer is you smack it with a baby planet. Yep. It's, it, that's what I would say is our response, is yeah. what came of it. I don't think many people like to make that connection um, <laughs> scientifically. But that's how I viewed it through my studies, is that it's quite interesting that the theory that we currently have is similar to the most crazy theory that came out of the 1880s. Uh, we just proposed a more rational mechanism by which it happened. Yeah, and that's it's kind of interesting that he didn't think like, oh, what if something just knocked it out of us? Um, yeah, there was, I mean, before they went to the moon, there was a lot of big debate because they had only seen the surface of the moon, is uh, what formed all those pimple-like holes that you still see yeah. on the moon? Are they giant volcanoes? What role does smashing objects into each other play into them? Um, and I think nowadays, impact cratering is much more widely accepted than it was in the 50s and 60s in terms of mm -hmm. Um, so maybe it's not, I mean, it would be hard for tools to imagine what an impact of that size would be like. Uh, I think very few people were studying or knew impact cratering as a science. Um, and so maybe if we had started realizing that giant impacts happened sooner in our scientific history, maybe he would have been drawn to it. But 
unfortunately, not till we were testing atomic bombs did we start looking at giant, that amount of kinetic energy from asteroids and stuff. And that's actually kind of an interesting aside, just another reminder to students about major components of scientific reality that we take for granted now. Um, one of them occurred pretty close to my own lifetime, which is the extinction event for the dinosaurs. Um, general acceptance of that is essentially within my lifetime, which is crazy to think because it is a fundamental part of our understanding of the Earth's history. Um, but the KT line, the discovery of this kind of global evidence for a giant impact was still debated in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in the 80s, there was the first notion that, well, hey, maybe an asteroid could release this amount of energy. And I don't think it was until the early 90s that they identified that iridium, this this element that you only find in extraterrestrial material, was in this this clay line, this ashy line that was found all over the planet. And so that's what led to this notion of the Chicxulub and the extinction of the dinosaurs from asteroid was impact cratering. And it, it's a very recent field of study. Um, yeah, and, and fun fact, because I was just watching Fantasia and there's an entire segment with Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, which is the extermination of dinosaurs. And I, it's not an asteroid impact. I think it's like just some random climate change. Climate change, yeah. Yeah, climate change got him. <laughs> um, so, okay, so this kind of ties to your PhD research then. Um, the students are familiar with the earth via collision hypothesis. It's in the David Rothery chapter of which is, I only have a photocopy because you have my actual books, Patrick. I do. They're <laughs> in my office to mail back to you. Yep. <laughs> but good thing I have a scanned copy of the first chapter for my students. Um, so they did read the origin of solar system, which includes the earth via collision. Um, so Obviously, the Apollo samples and the very slight Lunacod samples are huge parts of this. Um, maybe talk about what people do with the samples these days and what we're trying to kind of narrow down or constrain, as geologists like to say, uh, when it comes to that impact hypothesis and what the samples have left to tell in us if we haven't kind of wrung out all of the information we can get from them. Right, so with regards to this giant impact hypothesis the early sort of work that was being done was that that sort of led to this way of thinking was just sort of the composition of the rocks and comparing them to earth uh, just measuring things like magnesium iron calcium and things like that um, and the different ratios of those elements and it became pretty apparent that they were uh, the moon was iron poor and so the fact that all the iron and or not all the iron but lots of the iron was in the core of the earth and it was similar just to the mantle and the crust of the earth led to this hypothesis and then in the late 90s early 2000s we started looking at what we call isotopes and so isotopes particularly stable isotopes are basically studying elements um, different elements, for example, oxygen, have different mass depending on the amount of neutrons in it. And so oxygen 18 and oxygen 16 are two forms of oxygen. They react the same because they have the same charge, because they have the same protons, number of protons, uh, but they have different amounts of neutrons. Oxygen 16 has eight neutrons and oxygen 18 has 10 neutrons. And so they react the same, but because there's a mass, for instance, they separate uh, and segregate into different processes. So they tell us a lot about different processes because um, if, th if you think about 16 is lighter, uh, it's more reactive uh, because it's got less mass to move with it, so less energy is required. But oxygen 18 is a little different, but it's heavier. It requires more energy to involve it into the reaction. And what happened with numerous different stable isotopes, oxygen, chromium, iron, um, all of these, is that the moon looked identical to the Earth. And this was alarming 
because um, Mars, uh, Vesta, uh, the asteroid belt looks very different to us. Mm -hmm. So we have this issue that the moon looked, the moon in terms of its general chemistry is quite distinct to the Earth. But in terms of these um, isotopes, which we want to use to track different processes, look almost the same as the Earth. And that was completely unexpected. And so we are currently in a process of trying to explain that. Why would the Earth have the same isotopic composition as the Moon, but not the same general chemistry of the Moon in terms of amount of iron and the amount of magnesium and things like that. Um, and so a lot of people are working on that. Uh, it's over the past couple of years, it's expanded into new elements to see if it makes sense. Um, they've looked at numeric modeling, if you're more into physics and computer sciences, trying to understand, well, maybe maybe it was so energetic that it didn't that mass difference didn't matter because there was ample amount of energy and they just part they partitioned the same. Uh, mm -hmm. and trying to reconcile this impact with that process. Uh, some people have even proposed, well, maybe fair. So the, the different isotopic ratios are different because they formed at different distances from the sun, or at least it seems that uh -huh. way. So like Mars is different than Vesta and right. Earth. And so some people said, well, maybe the reason we collided with Fea was because it formed on the, at the same or similar distance from the sun. And so that's why we collided, was we were just so close together. And if they were so close together, they were sampling the same reservoir of material. Right. Uh, and so we shouldn't expect different isotopic ratios. Um, in terms of other work being done with the Apollo samples, there's still a lot to be done. Uh, if you've ever looked at a map of where the Apollos landed, it's all mm -hmm. on the near side. Yeah. And it's all around basically that the dark Mari stuff. Yeah. And that's associated with a chemical anomaly um, that doesn't actually represent most of the lunar crust. And so despite having over 400 uh, or around, I think it's 400 kilos of material, um, we don't actually have a truly representative sample of the, the crust of the moon. The best we have is Apollo 16, because yeah. it was the furthest away. Uh, but even then, we still don't have anything from the far side. Uh, and the only even in situ measurements we have from the far side would be Chang'e, is it four, four, four on the yeah. far side, uh, which recently took some measurements. Yeah. Um, and so though the Apollo sample sort of, as I think with most science, answered a lot of our questions, but also left a lot more questions to be asked because as we dived into it, it became more and more complicated and things that we thought would be simple to explain uh, have become a bit more harder. Uh, and the reason the moon is such a great place to sort of understand the early solar system is that most of the surface is less than three billion years old. And so it's preserving a lot of the stuff that the Earth has recycled with erosion and plate yeah. tectonics. Uh, and so if you really want to understand that early history, the moon is one of the best places to go. Yeah, it's a nice preserved surface for the most part. Um, you mentioned something that came up in my discussion with Tanya as well, which is the more we study with Mars is the same case, we get to know these bodies really well and we know them so well we start knowing what we don't know um so while things like neptune and uranus have major questions because we really know nothing um we don't have very specific questions about bodies because we don't know much um, but yeah. with the moon and mars we know so much that we now know a ton of specific things that we don't know at all um mm -hmm. so I just want to kind of close up towards the last few questions here. You know, you're and like any good scientist, you can imagine this, but most importantly, you're a scientist who understands the philosophy of science, which is, I think, something we don't have enough of. But 
can you imagine, you know, a world in the future where you're 70, you're retired, but you may be still going to conferences and the giant impact hypothesis has been completely disregarded? Um, I, I suppose. I, I, I mean, I think a, a good scientist is um, always skeptical and your ideas are only as good as if they can hold up to evidence. Um, I would say that um, a lot of scientists, especially geophysicists and geologists, love a good model. And mm -hmm. I mean, you have to understand that for many geologists, proving a model is worthwhile, it takes a career to do. And right. so when you start disproving it, people get upset because they start taking it personally and stuff. And I think we can't, we have to avoid that. And so if the giant hypothesis turns out to be wrong, uh, that's fine. I mean, as long as the new model is not just hokum and yeah. actually has line of evidence and, and stuff like that, I would say that the giant hypothesis with this new isotopic conundrum has sort of become slightly problematic because it's starting to, people are starting to reach out and propose extremely energetic environments. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the most recent proposal to try and explain why the, the, the chemical difference, but the same isotopic difference is that in almost the entire mantle and crust was vaporized from the earth. And so mm. that's almost infamable to imagine that the all that was left of the earth was the core. Um, but the, their compu computational models do allow for a partitioning of elements. That means that the earth gets lots of volatile material where the moon doesn't. Uh, all the iron would come towards the earth before the moon. But at the same time, you're proposing an environment that we've never seen. Mm. Uh, and I think maybe exoplanet exploration. And if we start seeing more um, Earth moon like bodies in other around other stars would be an excellent way to look at this. How how common are these giant impacts? Um, I think almost similar to astrobiology about asking how common is life if if we're the only planetary system that has a moon sized body around our own similar sized planet, mm -hmm. then I think we have to really call into question well how how likely is a giant impact right. so so yeah maybe maybe mm -hmm. it does turn out to be wrong um, and I think I look forward fine. to the old man Hill yeah. being at conferences and uh, more of a comment than a question. But when I was working with Apollo, yeah. Sam. <laughs> and I think another thing about the, as we go back uh, to the moon, if we go back, um, a lot of people are interested in what the deeper mantle looks like on the moon. And what if the mantle is a lot wetter than we think it is? Because we've always assumed the moon's dry. And that's sort right. of been one of the reasons why we think the giant hypothesis works is all hydrogen and lighter elements would have been eradicated from the, the moon because it was too energetic. But if it turns out to be wet, wetter than we'd like, maybe that throws the condensation theory back into it. I think that's probably unlikely, but it's a possibility. And it's something that we'll only get with more samples, better samples. And I think that's the same for Mars with what you were saying with Tanya. The set Mars yeah. sample term will revolutionize Martian geology yeah. because, because we'll have in situ rocks. Um, so you were describing, you know, all that's left to know about the moon. And again, with quite a few of my podcasts, and the way I've kind of been talking about planetary science as an outsider to my students is it really is a game of, well, it's not a game, but it's a, it's a profession of like Sherlock Holmes in space. Like it's, 
it's it's crime scene investigation. You get little bits of evidence here and there, and you're trying to recreate the past. Um, and you'll you maybe never really know if you've got it right, but you usually find out if you got it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what I've been telling students. If you're interested in planetary science, it really is a detective game. Um, and whether you choose craters as your evidence or uh, volcanoes or moons or whatever it is, uh, you know, you can kind of specialize in whatever you want. But I've been asking all my guests about, you know, any advice for going into the space sector for the students. Uh, I know if you use planetary science and lunar geology, but any advice or your experience in the space sector and what it's like? Um, I would say um, just keep an open mind about what you're interested in. Space is by definition interdisciplinary and you can attack it from any passion that you feel strongly about. Um, if you have a particular planet that you really love, if you love volcanoes, go study Venus or Mars, they're everywhere, or Io. Um, if there's something that just gets you really excited, uh, find and you really enjoy, um, then you can attack it from any direction, whether it's math heavy with computational um, or more hands on geology, if you like being outside or if you like coding and things like that, you could also do remote sensing. Um, or if you want to be the person that designs the tools that gets us these answers, you can attack it from an engineer nearing standpoint, um, space requires people that can think broadly. And like you said, you can't be closed minded to your ideas being wrong. Um, you have to always be willing to accept something differently. And I'd also say having a unique approach is really helpful too. a lot of what we sort of if you're more artistic and creative, having sort of a an ability to see these phenomena is really important. Um, I recently went to a talk from the lead science lead for Psyche and uh, oh, they yeah. were discuss they were discussing the fact that basically we have eight pixels of what Psyche looks like. Right. Uh, but we have all these. We know it's metallic to some extent. Um, it's an asteroid that's almost mostly either 60 to 90 percent made of metal. Um, but what does that look like in terms of uh, a geologic model? And, and they worked with an artist to try and make renditions of what that could look like and how Psyche could change. And as their theory changed, so did the model. So I think it requires someone who has like a, a plasticity associated with their thinking, ability to think out of the side of the box, uh, have fun, creative ideas and, and bring yourself to the team. Um, this, it's, the field is becoming, still has a long way to go, but uh, in, exceptionally inclusive and diverse. Um, and I think there's significant work evidence for efforts towards making it better. Um, uh, it still is a little bit dominated by old white people, men mm -hmm. particularly. Uh, um, but more and more there's inclusivity and diversity and we need people to. It won't be solved by same minded people looking at the same rocks and things and thinking the same way. We need different ideas and if in order to really crack these problems. Um, so the last thing, absolute last one, I promise, is the students have some assignments that have to do with space movies. And I mm. wanted to ask you what your favorite, it doesn't have to be a moon movie, but your favorite space movie, especially with a kind of planetary scientist lens, um, what it is. My favorite space movie is Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, um, Mainly, it is an Earth movie. It uh, is entirely also, I guess, astrobiology. It's one of those movies where aliens aren't inherently bad. Some good music theory in it, too. Uh, <laughs> really? A, a, a tonal vocabulary is established with the aliens. Ah, they yes. communicate, communicate through music. Uh, 
you get, uh, my I, partner, who who is a music theorist, is cringing, ignoring me at the moment. But tell uh, him, uh, tell tell Adam that I prefer the bitonality of Debussy. Oh, he prefers the bitonality of Debussy. He's just laughing at you right now. <laughs> um, in terms of maybe more geologic speaking, planetary science, where they go somewhere else. Um, Apollo 13 always gets me because that's just insane, but they didn't actually make it to the surface. No. <laughs> um, Apollo 18 is fun if you want a good little, a little spook. Uh, not if I'm with you. <laughs> if you want a good little scream. <laughs> uh, I like a, a rival too, but once again, not really planetary. Oh, yeah. But more that, I guess I like one, I should have been an, extra, uh, an astrobiologist. Yeah. Even though they haven't discovered what they study, but um, sort of how we interpret and would interact with extraterrestrial beings. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks, Patrick. And thanks to Adam as well for allowing this time while he bakes bread. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. 2090, that's it for this week's podcast. I hope you have taken good notes on the origin of the moon. Uh, again, thank you, Patrick. You're very welcome. And we'll see you next week, 2090. And that's where I'll play music. In the <laughs> <room>. <laughs> Did you see Fancy Pants jumped up? I did, I saw Fancy Pants.